comes back to Tuesday. Huh? <laughs> Four thirty. Yeah. So as an as announced, as, as announced, I mean, there'll be an announcement if something goes wrong. So we're going to try to do to the heptagon today. Uh, presuming Let's make a few comments as to what's going to happen starting on February 1st. As so far as I know what's going to happen, I'll make a few comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk today basically about the heptadecagon. We're just going to repeat what we did for the pentagon, except we have 17 in place of 5, so that we should be able to understand things completely. So we know that therefore that we have 17 seventeenth roots of 1. So this looks exactly like the fifth roots of 1 except there are 17 of them. I can get it, sorry. Um, I, I've got a question for you. <laughs> um, so there they are, all 17 of them on the diagram. So, and we know we, we exclude z sub 0 equal 1, and then we know that all the other ones satisfy an equation like that. So this is the same equation as we had for 5, only for 5 it stops at 4, now it stops at 16. And we take as true of this fact that we proved for 5, that I said was true in general and can be proven in the same way, that they don't satisfy an equation of, sm of smaller degree, and that just means, if you like, so z2 is z1 squared, z3 is z1 cubed, and that just means that if a1, a2, and so on up to a16 are just ordinary fractions, these numbers are all different. So in some sense, we can get a whole collection of numbers just by substituting for a1, a2, a3, and so forth. Uh, appropriate fractions, so appropriate rational numbers. Now in particular, because of this relation, if all the a's are equal, so if a1 is equal to a2 is equal to a3, they're all equal and equal to some number a, then this sum here is just the number minus a. So in particular, among the numbers of this sort are the ordinary fractions. Now we come, we have to come to the hard part, the symmetries. Now, what will turn out, because of the, because this is the only equation satisfied by any of these things, basically the only equation, all these numbers, z1, z2, and so on up to z16, basically are on equal footing. We can't tell them apart because the only thing we know about them is that they satisfy this equation. And that means that there are quite, I mean, that the situation, although we don't see the symmetry, certainly not geometrically, algebraically, they're all identical, and that means we can think of the symmetries, which just consist of replacing say, z1 by z2. So if we replace z1 by z2, then everything else follows along. We have to replace z1 squared, which is z2, by z2 squared, which is z4. We have to replace z3, which is z1 cubed, by z2 cubed, and so on. So this, this one little arrow controls the whole symmetry because, because all the other numbers Z1 is Z2 is Z1 squared, Z13 is Z1 to the 13th power, and so on. So that's one possible symmetry. A second one is to take Z1 into Z3, and then the others follow along. If you take Z1 to Z3, then Z2 is carried along. It has to go to Z1 cubed, to Z1. Well, Z1 goes into Z3. Z2, which is Z1 squared, would then have to go into Z3 squared, and so on. Now, what we're interested in is, at the moment, is repeated symmetry. So let's take a particular one. Let's take the one that takes z1 to z2, then z1, z5, which is z15, goes to z2 to the 5, 
to z1 squared to the fifth, which is z1 to the tenth. So z5 goes into z1 to the tenth, which is z10. z9 goes into z2 to the ninth. Well, z9 is z1 to the ninth. It goes into z2 to the ninth, which is z1 to the eighteenth. And as we know, z1 to the seventeenth is one, so we just throw away that part, and we're left with z1. So z9 goes into z1. So that particular reflection, let's look at it carefully, the one that takes z1 to z2. We call it rho, and we're going to repeat it over and over again, just as we did, just, just to see what happens. As I said, we have not to trace its effect on z1, because then we know if we see what's happening to z1, then we just, all the other ones are powers of z1, and they transform accordingly. And we can get any number just by adding things up. These symmetries never touch the, co the coefficient because one is distinguished. One, a symmetry cannot move one because one is a very special number, namely one has the property that if we multiply any other number by one, we get the number back again. So one cannot be changed. And since two is one plus one, we never change two. because we. And, and since then one half is one over two, we don't change one half and so on. So the, the ordinary fractions are never are never touched by these symmetries, so that we shouldn't forget. All right. So let's look then at a little dangerous in, in the front row with, 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 with this stick. I tend to forget that I have it in my hand. <laughs> Point it. All right. So let's see what happens now. If I point out here, we have 16 symmetries in all because we can take z1, well, to itself, that's a trivial symmetry. We just don't change anything. Or we can take it to any of the other 16 things. Now, let's see what happens when we start repeating this one symmetry row. You see, so we just, as I, I don't know whether this simile of a mirror is all right, but we just think of it as happening twice. So we first apply it in one mirror, and then z1 goes to z2. And then the next time z2 goes to something else, well, z2, as we observed here, uh, well, z2 is z1 squared. So since z1 goes to z2, z2 goes to z2 squared, which is z4. So if we combine them, first z1 goes to z2, and then that z2 goes to z4. So all in all, when we do this reflection twice, what we see z1 as is z4. Now do it again. First of all, z1 z goes to z4. That means we have the double image. And the triple image, we see what happens to z4. Z4 is Z1 to the fourth. It goes to Z2 to the fourth, which is Z8. So all in all, when we do this three times, Z1 goes to Z8. So we have this triple reflection. And now let's do it one more. So the third reflection is Z8. Now Z8 is Z1 to the eighth. That goes to Z2 to the eighth, which is Z16. So all in all, if we reflect four times, we get 16. Now, all we do is just clear what we do. We just keep squaring this. So th this is four times. The fifth time, z16 goes to z to the 32nd. But 32nd, 32 is 17 plus 15. Seven, z to the z1 to the 17th is just 1. So all we're left with is z1 to the 15th, which is z to the 15th. So we go on. And notice that. So all in all, what happens if we see what happens? We First of all, z1 goes to z2, we repeat. And if we repeat eight times, then we just see what we originally saw. So if we reflect eight times, we see what we had in the beginning. And this is unsatisfactory because we would really like to see all these 16 symmetries appearing. We just see half of them appearing. You see, z1 goes into z2, z1 goes into z4, 8, 60. And the order here is a little bit peculiar. And we don't know at this point that 
we could find by some other choice of starting row, we don't know that we could generate all 16. And in fact, we can, and it turns out that if we start with Z1 going into Z3 and go through the same process, we're going to get them all. So let's start with sigma, which is more complicated, to reflect Z1 to Z3. So Z3 then, which is Z1 cubed, go to, goes to Z3 cubed, which is Z1 to the ninth, and so on. And let's see what happens there. All right. Well, it's more complicated, but this time we get them all. So it just turns out, you just have to check it. No, Z1 goes into Z3. And then so Z3 is Z1 cubed, it goes into Z3 cubed, which is Z9. So doing it twice, Z1 goes into Z9. Doing it three times, well, after two steps, it goes to Z9. But Z9 is Z1 to the 9th, so that goes to Z3 to the 9th, which is Z1 cubed to the 9th, which is Z1 to the 27th. And because Z1 to the 17th is 1, 27 minus 17 is 10. All we're left is Z1 to the 10th. So it just turns out that if you do this, then indeed, as you work down, so if you think, so this is 9. 10 is 9 times 3, in which I've thrown away 17. Now I do 10 times 3, which is 30. And I throw away, so this should be Z1 to the 30th, but I can throw away the 17. And 17 plus 13 is 30. So I get 13. The next step, this would go, I cube it again. I get Z1 to the 39. I have 17 plus 17 is 34. I can throw away Z1 to the 34. I'm left with Z1 to the 5th, which is Z5. Okay. So this is a little bit more complicated than the four-fold symmetry than we had for the prime five. It's a 16-fold symmetry, but there's one basic symmetry. There's at least one. There may be more. But the reflection from Z1 to Z3 just generates all the others. That means that we can measure the symmetry. Remember, we were looking at We were looking at these numbers. Now, the the more, so to speak, some some numbers will be not be changed. They'll come back to themselves under under certain reflections and not under others. The best thing is, for example, for them to come back to themselves under sigma itself. One reflection by sigma, and let me just show you what I mean. That's the most symmetric thing. So the most symmetric numbers are those which are not changed by any, by sigma or by sigma squared, which is sigma repeated twice, sigma cubed, the sigma repeated three times, and so on. Well, if it's not, they're not changed by sigma itself, then they're not going to be changed by sigma squared. By repeating sigma, they're not going to be changed by repeating it three times. So what happens if the number is not changed? Well, the number, its look is changed because if we start off with this, then sigma takes z1 to z3. Z2, z2 goes to z6. This is z1 squared goes to z3 squared, which is z6. And it should be a should be able to read that off from here somewhere. If Z2 goes to Z6, Z3 goes to Z9. That's all right. So all, all those should find a place here somewhere. Oh, yes, there it is. So it should be. Z4 goes to Z to the 12th, and Z to the 5th would go to Z to the 15th. But what does that mean? If this number is the same as this, it means the coefficient of z3 here is the same as the coefficient of z3 here, because with different coefficients, the numbers are different. So the two are the same. So a1 is the same as a3. All right. But for the same reason, the coefficient, let's see. So the coefficient 
of z to the 9. So a1 is the same as a3. Those are the same coefficient. The coefficient of z to the 9th here is a3. So a3 is equal to a9. And then we've done, written it down here, but then we find a9 here will have to be equal to a10. And when we work all the way through it, we'll discover that all the coefficients are equal. So they're all equal to some number a. And that means that a, some ordinary fraction, az1 plus az2 plus az3, since the sum of z1, z2, z3, and so on is minus 1, that's just minus a. So those numbers that are most symmetric are the numbers we have already, namely the ordinary fraction. So the next step is to look at the second most symmetric number. So those would be the numbers that are perhaps not in, that are perhaps changed when we apply sigma, but are not changed when we apply sigma squared. All right? So if they're not changed when we apply sigma two times, then they're not changed when we apply sigma four times, they're not changed when we apply sigma six times, eight times, 10, 12, 14, or well, 16 is not important. So that means, what it means is, see, since sigma squared takes z1 into z9, and sigma fourth takes z1 into z13, and sigma sixth, it will mean that the coefficients of z1, z9, z13, z15, z16, z8, z4, z2, will all be the same as the coefficient of z1. And that means, basically, we'll have something like that, or, do it if you like. You can. This is what happens when, if, if we just apply sigma once, we get z3. But now applying sigma cubed to z3, sigma squared to z3, just like applying sigma cubed to z1. So z3, z10, z5, z11, z14, and so on, will for the same reason all have the same coefficient. So either we'll have something like this times some general coefficient plus something like this times another general coefficient. So basically, there, apart from rational coefficients here, there are only two numbers with the slightly less general symmetry. And we, who, who, that are, uh, let me say that again, that aren't quite, that aren't completely symmetric, but are almost completely symmetric in the sense that they're not changed when we apply the reflection twice. So there we have two of them. Okay, now the point is that, that that means we're going to be able to solve for this easily. Why? For the following reason. Namely, because these symmetries respect multiplying, particularly in both, respect multiplying a number by itself, we don't lose any symmetry when we square. <coughs> so this has the same s symmetry as, eight, as, as the period 8, 1. The 8, by the way, says the period is of length, has, contains 8 terms. The 1 says it starts with Z1. 8 and 3, 8 terms starts with Z3. So this has the same symmetry as 8, as eight and 1. That means it must be a number of the kind we said, so kind we indicated. So it must be some ordinary fraction times the first period plus some other ordinary fraction times the second period. But the second period, the sum is minus 1, as we've insisted. So that means that, that this squared will be equal to some rational number times itself plus some other rational number. Right? So what does this say? This says that this satisfies the quadratic equation. Therefore, we can find it. But with a ruler and compass. Well, let's write it down. But uh, we can, in order to carry that out effectively, we have to know what this number A minus B is and what this number B is. Right? Because that... That will tell us what, what quadratic equation to solve. Uh, it will tell us, in other words, what construction to perform. So we have to know how to, how to calculate. We have to calculate this number. Well, in 
other words, we have to multiply the sum of these things with the sum of these things. Well, we have to, if we're going to do it, we just have to do it one at a time. Let's multiply Z1 times Z1, that's this. Z1 times Z9 is Z1 to the 1 plus Z1 to the 9th is Z1 to the 10th. Z1 to the 1 times Z1 to the 13th is Z1 to the 14th, which is Z to the 14th, and so on. And we just do that with all of them. Z to the 9th plus Z to the 15th is Z1 to the 9th plus Z1 to the 15th. Z1 to the 24th, and 24 is 17 plus 7, and Z1 to the 17th is just 1, so we're just left with Z1 to the 7th. All right? So what you see is that we see 8 here. For example, Z1 times 6, 1. Z1 times Z1 to the 16th is Z1 to the 17th, which is 1. So we have 8 1s here. That's that 8. We have to add them all up now. Now, you see that all those together in that line, red line, when we add them up, we get 1 period 8 comma 1. And with the blue line, we add them up, we get a second period 8 comma 1. And with the green line, whatever the green line is, something similar. And that's so we get 8 comma 1 three times. And then just the same way, the black lines, I didn't have enough colors, but here we go. The black line is here. And we, once we get here, we have to go over here in the same row and skip down there. And then we back up and skip down there. So we have one, two, three, and then the Z3 goes all along with this. So we have four H comma three. So we find out that this number, that the square of eight comma one, it's this number, and as we promised, it's a number of the same sort, because this is a number of that sort, this is a number of that sort, and 8 is just minus this, minus that. So let's, in particular, let's remove this. This 4 times 8 comma 3 is, according to this, minus 4 minus 4 times 8 comma 1. So minus 4 times 8 comma 1 leaves us with that. And minus 4 from 8 leaves with plus 4. So the square of this first period is just this, as we promised. It's a number of the same, satisfies a quadratic equation. Uh, it's a number of the same kind. We solve the quadratic equation. So we get this, minus 1, plus and minus square root of 17 over 2. And if you check, we don't know. I mean, one could work at it and try to de decide theoretically which, which it was, but, but you see, algebraically, plus square root of 17 is pretty much the same as minus square root of 17. Now, if we don't know anything about algebra, we can't tell them apart. But uh, as it turns, but these are, are precise complex numbers, and so we work, we can just calculate them if we like approximately, uh, just by using, just by using decimal numbers, and approximately, the left side is approximately that, and the right side is approximately that if we take a plus. It's just a minus, it's not approximately that. that. So that's the conclusion. So <coughs> we're at the first step. We've discovered that this number, this first period, can be expressed in terms by taking one square root of a number we already have, which is 17. 2 squared plus 1. All right? So Um, notice in particular that we couldn't have this equation unless this were irrational because we know that we can't have any relations among our numbers. I was, if this were rational, this would be a rational number, so this would be something of the form a times 8 plus comma 1 plus 8 comma 3, and that would be a relation that we said we can't have. So, in particular, this proof of Gauss shows that the square root of 17 is irrational. <coughs> but in any case, there it is. We've, we've made our first move. We know that we can construct this number by extracting the square root. Now we just have to go on.
So what we just we just move on to those elements that so are. Pardon. Why? Why it does not use it? Well, I said what I, the, the simplest way. There are other ways I think of arguing, but the simplest way is just to observe that you can approximate both sides. Okay, the both of them are represented as complex numbers, and if you approximate with a plus, you see the numbers are about equal. You use a minus, you see the numbers are far from equal, hmm? approximately. So therefore, they're not equal. Mm -hmm. This, this is Gauss's procedure. He simply, uh, we're a little bit better off than Gauss because at least <laughs> we do it on the computer. He does it by hand. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> well, I don't, I can't test that. Does it correctly? Does it first? All right. So so let's go one step up. Let's look at the numbers that aren't so symmetric, that aren't cha that are changed perhaps when we apply sigma twice. Uh, if we apply sigma four times, and they come back where we started. That's if you look at. If we go back. Where did we were? So we'll come back to that value. So that would mean we apply sigma four times. We'd start from one. We'd end up with 13. Go one, two, three, four. We'd end up with 16. Better check that. Yeah. And then we 16, and then we go one, two, three, four times. End up with four. So that means that all z1, z13, z16, and z4 appear with the same coefficient. And then z3, one, two, three, z5. Z14 and so on also appear with the same coefficient. So these are the four possibilities. So we have four parameters that have to be ordinary fractions that we're free to insert. But we have many more possibilities. Now what we want to find are, we only have, it turns out we won't have to find them all, but we have, well in essence we have to find out what all of them are. So let's just uh, start. You see, let's just me say something in general. Uh, I th every, every number fixed by sigma to the fourth will be of this form. I can think of there being four basic numbers of this form. One is of this form because one is just, I put minus here, minus here, minus here, minus here. And then when I add these up, I just get minus one. So. 8, 1 is a number of this form because 8, 1 is the sum of 4, 1 and 4, 9. So that's of this form. And although I won't check it because we don't need it, this would be, I need a one more number to represent everything, and I could take it as that. So that means there, the basic numbers are this, this, 1, and this. Now 4 times this number has the same is every bit as symmetric as 4, 1. Could might even be more symmetric, although it's not. So it must be something of this form. So it must be 4 times 1 plus times some const, some ordinary fraction, plus this number times some ordinary fraction. That means that A would have to be some fraction times this period plus D. And E could be some fraction times this period plus F. So that's, that should be B. That should be B. All right. So that means, I'll actually do a little better, that this is a quadratic equation. This will satisfy a quadratic equation in which the coefficients first coefficient is minus a, and the second coefficient is minus b. 4, 1 squared minus a times 4, comma 1 minus b is equal to 0. That means I can solve for 4, comma 1, 
but I'm going to be extracting a square root in which this square root in which this is a number formed from 8 comma 1 and 8 comma 3. So I'm going to be extracting a square root of something which is compli more complicated that I've already found at my first at the first stage. So this is the second. So rather than go through that process, I do something just a little bit different. I take 4 comma 1 and 4 comma 9 and observe that they're the two roots of this equation because 4 comma 1 makes that vanish and 4 comma 9 makes that vanish. So I multiply out. So it's z squared, then I get cross terms, this cross term and that cross term give me that, but the sum of those two things, sum of these terms and these terms just give me everything that made up that period of length 8, so that just gives me 8 comma 1. Now all that's left that I have to, to multiply is this. It's a little bit better than that. This would involve four terms times eight terms, so this involves 32 multiplications. This involves 16. That would be easier. And not only that, but the result is simpler. All right, so there it is. One multiplies the same way. Z9 times Z1 is z1 to the 9 plus 1, z1 to the 10, which is that. z9 times z13 is z1 to the 9th times z1 to the 13th, z1 to the 22nd, but the z1 to the 17th goes away, and that leaves 22 minus 17, which is 5. But that's uh, rather nicer because what we see is that we just have all 16 terms, each one. So all those numbers, unless I made a typing error, are different. So their sum is minus 1, and that means that this is minus 1, and this is the equation that, I ha that satisfies. So 4 times 1, I just have to solve this is, is equal to this, with a plus or minus that has to be determined. All right. And then, just to make that a little simpler, I use the equation that I had for 8 comma 1, which is minus 8 comma 1 plus 4. I know this number. So if I use that, substitute it in, I get, I add 4 to it, I get 8 minus 8 comma 1. So 4 comma 1, there could be a minus sign, but I eliminate the minus sign by an approximate calculation. Following go. So this is equal to that. And then I just calculate that approximately with the plus so that I know it's not the minus. The minus sign would give me this, which is far different than that. So there's no question that the, I don't need a very careful approximation to distinguish between them. All right. So there we are. We're one step further along. <coughs> we now let's we go to the next numbers. And we'll just take one period. We won't write down them all. We'll just take one period, which is the one that's fixed by the eighth <coughs> power of sigma. <coughs> by the way, the next step would be the 16th power of sigma, but we observed that we could repeat sigma 16 times. We get back to the reflection. It just tend, sends z1 into z1, and so it sends any number into it into the, the same number. So the next step will just be, con the final one will be to consider all numbers, those numbers that don't have any particular symmetry. So we want to find an expression for this. For that purpose, we also consider this, because this is a, this means it's a period of length 2. <coughs> so we take z to the, start off at 13, and we apply sigma to the eighth to it, we'll get z to the fourth. So this and this have the next degree of symmetry, so they're not completely asymmetric, but they have very little symmetry. We choose this because the sum is that. And then we'll go back and use exactly the same trick
namely, to use it as we used here, namely, we use this kind of quadratic equation, except we use two, these two little periods. So we have to multiply them together. We multiply them together. Unfortunately, it gives 4 comma 3, and that we, ha that we hadn't calculated yet. So we want to calculate this. Just as here, we'll put it together with Z13 to get a quadratic equation in which this coefficient of z will be the sum of these two, which will be 4 comma 1. But unfortunately, the product, so this term, is no longer minus 1. It's something a little more complicated. <coughs> so we have to go back and calculate it. We could either express it somehow in terms of 4 comma 1. That might be complicated. So what we do is we simply go back and calculate it in the same way we calculated 4 comma 1. We just go back and do it. And the thing is, the, the sum is this long period, but this long period I can easily calculate from 8 comma 1 since its sum with 8 comma 1 is minus 1. So this, this 8 comma 3 is easy to calculate. So now I'm going to calculate 4 comma 3 in exactly the same way. This doesn't go on forever. You, we're at the penultimate step here, so... Just, just about done. We have to calculate it. We have to calculate four terms, product of 16 terms. Turns out the sum is minus 1, as it was with 4 comma 1. So this is the number 4 comma 3. The sign is positive. We check it numerically. So there it is, 4 comma 3. And we can write it out fully if we're so inclined. We have to take square root twice, one square root in here and one square root in there. So there we go. We now have our equation for 2 comma 1 that we proceed to calculate. What is it? It's the minus 4, 1, which was the sum. All right. We lose track here, but... The sum of those two numbers was 4 comma 1, which is the number that appears here. And then the product was 4 comma 3, and that's the number that appears here. So we solve it. It's this. So all we have to do is to find the complete expression is just calculate this number. So we have to square 4 comma 1. This expression here is 4 comma 1. We have to subtract from it square minus 4 times 4 comma 3, which we found to be that. Well, no, to square this, we have to square this. We have to square this, and then we have to take the cross term, and the cross term twice, and there'll be this 4, that, this 2 that gets squared to make 4. So we square this, and do it. The 2 minus 1 squared is 1. Square root of 17, square root of 17. The cross terms are minus 2 times the square root of 17. And uh, so that's that. And then I simplify a little. 1 plus 17 is 18 over 4, which is 9 over 2. Minus 2 times square root of 17 over 4. Two, 1, 2 cancels. I'm left with that. So that's this little bit squared. If I square everything here. I have to get a 2 squared is 4. And I have to take the square of this, which is that. I have to add it to the square of this, which is that. And that's, those two added together with any luck gives me 13 minus the square root of 17. For example, 9 plus 17 is 26 divided by 2 is 13. And then I have to have the cross term. This piece this piece, and there's a 2, the cross term comes twice, so it cancels the 2, and there's this 4 that's left from squaring that. So that's that 4. So altogether, we have that. That's, that's this 2, 1. And I write it out a little more carefully. I mean, I, I'm sorry, altogether we have, sorry, that's not that. We just have this 
the expression under the square root sign so far. That's the expression under the square root sign. And then we have the first part, which we calculate because we know what 4, 1 is at this expression with an extra 2. So this is here. That's the first part here, coming from here. I didn't put a plus or minus here. I anticipated, I suppose, knowing it would be a plus. And then what I have here, what I have here is the square root of this. I have an extra 2 coming from the fact that I divided by 2, and I simplified this just a little bit. For example, I, I, I'm taking something out from under the square root sign. That means something else goes up here. This piece here is 4 times 17 plus 4 times 3, which is 12 times square root of 17. So this little bit, remember, this is what goes under the square root sign here. This little bit, including the 8 there, is this piece. Um, this little bit is that piece. Notice that I do something with the 2. I put an extra 2 up here. So 2 times 17 is 34 plus 2 times the square root of 17. That's this piece. And all the 2's work out. I just write it this way. 16 under the square root sign and an 8 that somehow comes out. And finally, I'm left with the square root of this. And once again, I put 1 minus the square root of 17 and about the minus 1 here. I fiddle with the two twos in exactly the same way to make it come out to be that. This is two times well, there's a two here, which is two times. So I put a two here, it makes that four, so I can bring it out as a two, and I get two times seventeen, which is thirty-four, minus two times square root of seventeen, which is here. So this is the penultimate step. I have one, two, three composed square roots. And this is the form that Klein gives. Um, I somehow, I think it must be typical for Gauss that he simplifies always. So, Can Gauss. I ask a question? Sure. Where did you get Klein from? Who is this Klein? Oh, who is this Klein? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not an uncommon name. Uh, actually, you've heard of this Klein in this lecture, maybe. Because at one point, and I think it's even in the notes, I gave a list of texts that I'd used. Uh, and uh, I, I think the title of Klein's uh, le uh, lectures is Some Elementary Problem, Mathematical, Elementary Problems from an Advanced Standpoint, something like this. So, and in particular, so I think it's in your notes, I can give it to you again. Uh, I won't try to give the transparency. But uh, he treats several classical problems of the uh, tri trisection of the angle, duplication of the cube, and in particular he treats uh, Gauss's uh, construction of the 17, regular 17-sided uh, polygon in some detail. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, I could find it here in my notes if I could. So it's worth, Klein is worth looking at, and I'll come back to him. So thanks for asking. So this is Felix, <coughs> Felix Klein. He was uh, a colleague of Hilbert in Göttingen, among other things. So here we have 2 comma 1. Gauss gives the same number in a slightly different form, and he's, which is simplified. He, he simplifies what's under the square root sign, and I just tell you, in case you want to work it out for yourself, that he uses this identity, that this is equal to that is equal to that. Looks funny to me. I don't know. I don't know. Must be what I mean. Now I think that. I think that if you, if you work out one plus the square root of seventeen squared, you see that it's that. So this is all right. So. So 
So I say what this means. If it just says, for example, the 16 times 34, which is what we have, the part here, which has no radical in it, is equal to 18 times 34, is this times this, and this times this is minus 4 times 17. So the first part here is equal to this, minus the, the square of that, and the second part of 16 times 2 with the radical is equal to what I get from the radical here, which is 2 times 34 minus 18 times 2. Yeah. Okay. So 37, on 37 must be a 17. Suspicious. 37 must be a 17. Yes, it it's very suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly <laughs> contravenes the tenets of Galois theory. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, as I now established that two comma one can be found by repeatedly exacting square roots, and that's what it is. So z one was that, and z sixteen is equal to cosine thirty two pi over seventeen. Thirty two pi over seventeen is thirty four pi over seventeen minus 2 pi over 17, and the 2 pi doesn't matter when we take the cosine, and the minus doesn't matter when we take the cosine. So z16 is that, which is just z1 with a minus sign here instead of a plus. So that means that 2 comma 1 is this, 2 cosine of 2 pi over 17. So cosine of 2 pi over 17 can be found by repeatedly extracting square roots. Now, if we want to find z1, we can just observe that it satisfies this equation. So that's one more square root. And, that, and that's, and z1 is, once we have z1, we have everything. So four times around, we have everything. But the usual way to construct, once we have this, the usual way is the obvious way. Namely, we don't bother with the last step bother with the algebraic aspects of the last step. We just say, well, if this is cosine of 2 pi over 17, we take the circle of radius 1, we erect the per perpendicular, and that's the point z1 we're looking for. So this line, which is in red, although you can't see it very well, at least I can't see it very well, is one of the sides of our <coughs> heptadecagon. And of course, once we have one, then we just mark off with the compass this length and get all the others by moving around. So that means we're, we're, we have done it. We've shown that the regular heptadecagon can be constructed algebraically by these sequence of steps. Can I ask about, about this? Uh, if we go back to the case of phi, uh -huh. the geometric construction of the regular heptadecagon was really extremely simple. It's really proof of very complicated. And the formula to be sort of algebra I will come briefly to that. I'll have to be brief, but I, I the, the construction wasn't that simple. There were there were three or four steps, right? Yeah, but I mean that's nothing compared to all those steps. Well, it's, uh, we only have four square roots, right? So that means we have four steps basically. But hmm? in any case, let's. Uh, I'll come to it in just a moment. Yeah, I mean, plus two times the square root and the square root of that. I mean, there are lots of square roots. Oh, if I, uh, can, can I come back to your question in just a second? So let's, let's just look at it abstractly. Right? <coughs> abstractly, what we've done, those were the most symmetric things apart from fractions. We first constructed them. It was enough to construct that because that was basically the same thing. Then we constructed, next step was this and this. And they, those two we had to construct differently. And then we constructed 2, 1, and then there was one final step. All right, the final step you'd accept. So it's really to get up to this stage. So here's Klein mentioned again. Right? 
famous problems of elementary geometry is the title of the text, and it's in the, certainly in the mathematics library. So, okay, th uh, but th I haven't answered your question. Let me just say what Klein does. You see, remember with Descartes, we, Descartes observed that you could always find a square root. Uh, well, what Klein gives, I mean, there are many possibilities, I assume, but let me just say, tell you what Klein does. He says he can always, he gives a construction for solving, for finding the square, the, solu the roots of an arbor arbitrary quadratic equation. Hmm? So if he has a quadratic equation and p and q are the two coefficients and let's suppose p is not zero, he says I can s find the two roots in the following way. This is a circle of radius one. And these are two parallel tangents. And I might, I'll take this to be, for example, the axis of abscissus, uh, and this to be two further up. He says, if you have P and Q, so this is the zero point. Here, this is the center. This is the zero point right here. Mark off from this zero point. So you think this is the perpendicular. This is perpendicular to these two lines passing through the center. Mark off four a distance four over P here. Mark off a distance Q over P there. Draw this line, that will give you one of the roots, and draw this line, that will give you the other root. All right? Now, we know what P and Q are, say, at the first step. All right? So that means that we could construct 8, 1 and 8, 3 in one step. All right? So that's, with a diagram like that, we can think of x1 and x2 as being 8, 1 and 8, 3. Then, at the next stage, 4, 1 and 4, 3 had to be constructed separately, <coughs> one with 8, 1, one with 8, 3. So that means we're going to need two more diagrams of this sort to get 4, 1 and 4, 3. And then one more for uh, 2, 1, and then we're done. Now, Klein does them separately, and then he just puts them all together. <laughs> so that's what that's everything. So that's the first stage, right? That's let me put that. So that that line, the big long line there is this line at the first stage, right? So that and then you see so he draws this this would be either this would be for four comma three I guess and then the other point of intersection is that so this would be four comma one and these would give the coefficients at the next stage so presumably this is the next stage and so on so that's everything mm -hmm. now it is worth right, but, uh, uh, but that uh, it's not so inefficient hmm? and if one follows this procedure with five does one get I doubt it. <laughs> no, I think the answer is no. <laughs> but a member of the audience, Robert Klein, maybe some of you have seen Robert Feinberg, excuse me, pointed out to me that um, you can do, you can, there's a recent article for 257 if you want to. With, without a without a picture, <laughs> without with no picture corresponding to that, but there is a discussion of the algebra for 257. See, 257 is like 17. It's a prime number, and if I subtract one from it, I get a power of two. So it's two to the eighth, I guess. So that means we can do this here instead of uh, four degrees of symmetry. There are eight degrees of symmetry, but. And, and there, are, there are some other cases, but this is, as far as I know, the only one which has been discussed in, in print. And there it is. It's in this this journal, which is available both in the mathematics library and in the common room of the mathematics building. So you can take a look at it. All right. So that that was it. We have we managed in some sense. Now the question is, uh, what are we going to do? With any luck, in uh, in spring, hmm? on middle and uh, midwinter.
All right, well, that requires some preparation on my part. But, and I don't think I will do <coughs> quite so much as I had at first intended, and I don't know what, what, what I indicated. But there are two curious math uh, there are two mathematicians who were quite, quite different, who were born one year apart. One was Galois and one was Kummer. Uh, one was born 18, I'll go into this in a little more detail. One was born 1809 and one was born 1810. One, Galois was, uh, he was a very passionate young man and in particular he was taken up uh, with Republican goals at the uh, time of the Revolution 1830. He was one of the Republicans who was not satisfied with Louis, the Philippe, Louis Philippe, who wanted a, a Republican regime. And he would have been at the 19 or 20 at the time. He was quite out, outspoken. I don't suppose he had to be very outspoken at that time. And uh, he came to uh, a bad end at the age of 22. I think probably, if you look at the story, at the hands of Louis Philippe's secret police. It's obscure. Hmm? Uh, I think what, if, if you look at the story, that it appears to be, have been some trumped up duel, but I think if you look, uh, somebody more familiar with the uh, social situation in France in 1832 than I would have to explain, would have to, should, should look at it. There are mathematicians who, who have theories about this, but I don't suppose they're that familiar with the back, social background. It just looks, however, uh, as though two thugs, hmm, you know, incited by the, the, the secret police, you know, challenged him on false pretenses to a duel and murdered him. That's, so, uh, Galois, was created of Galois theory, which is one <coughs> of the ways this can go, came to, uh, did not live very long, but managed, you know, before he was 22, to, to write some papers that I'll show you, because they're very, pa his very passion, he wrote, he wrote some of his, what Lindley wrote under curious conditions in, in prison or out of prison and uh, he was deaf and so on and uh, it, it makes for magnificent reading. Kuma on the other hand was born in, uh, he was born in Thuringia as I recall, someplace uh, I, I'm not quite sure but his, his life, he lived until he was 80, he went from uh, down in Thuringia to Breslau and then to Berlin. So he didn't get very far. It's like spending all your life in New Jersey, if you think <laughs> about it. And uh, he, he lived to uh, a ripe old age. He lived in his 80s. And uh, he created, he went in another direction. He created a cyclotomic field. He was uh, not a passionate Republican. He was not extremely conservative, but he was a supporter of the Prussian monarchy. He did, uh, oddly enough, and the, I, I, I'll have to, I think I'll look this up but because I forget it. He was, I mean, there was this complicated uh, tier system of elections in, uh, in, in Prussia after, it was instituted in Prussia after 1848, and I think he was at, elected at the third tier in Vesla. And he recounts in some of his letters to uh, Kronecker his, uh, his debates with, with more Republican candidates, with uh, candidates who were uh, Republicans. He obviously disapproved of them, but he was a dean. He was for a long time a dean. He was, I think, secretary of the uh, Prussian Royal Academy and so on. So it was quite different. He was, he, just as Galois was in some, some sense the successor of Gauss, and uh, he also created more slowly, with perhaps less passion, but a certain humor, uh, a theory, namely the theory of cyclotomic fields, which, which is quite pertinent to Fermat, uh, and he handled, of course, a great many cases of Fermat's theorem by means of this theory. So I would like to talk about Galois a little bit and Kummer. And whether I get beyond that, I don't know. All right, but thank you very much for your attention, and as I say, I'll be back here at least on February the 1st, and there's something untoward. <laughs>